where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us all every day. I'm Pam Carlin, along with Joe Bankman. And Joe, you're a psychologist in addition to being a lawyer and a law professor. So tell me a little bit about how you got that fascination with the mind and what it's made you think about. Well, you know, psychologists, we're pretty old-fashioned if we're clinicians. We figure out what people are thinking by asking them and listening to them and looking to see if they're doing things like smiling. (laughs) But we can't help but read about advances in neuroscience. We can actually look to see what parts of the brain are activated when people see or say something and what kind of brain waves people are emanating. Yeah, and it, it, I think it's changing our way of thinking about how we figure out what people are thinking and also has, obviously, implications for the law. And we have two of our colleagues here with us today who can really shed some light on things that we think about but we didn't think we thought about in quite this way. So the first of them I'll introduce is Hank Greeley. Hank's a professor both at the law school and by courtesy at the medical school. He specializes in the legal and social implications of biomedical technologies, and in particular, uh, of particular interest for what we're talking about today, of neurobiology and neuroscience. He's also the director both of the law school's Center for Law and the Biosciences and the Stanford Program in Neuroscience and Society. And then he wrote a book with probably the scariest title for the prospects for a future happiness of people everywhere called The End of Sex. (laughs) Um, Although it isn't really about that. It's really about the end of sex as the way that we reproduce. So Hank is really at the forefront of understanding uh, how science affects a vast range of legal issues, and in particular ones uh, dealing with neuroscience. And I guess what we're thinking about today, Hank, is how is it, do advances in neuroscience allow us to detect deception or determine whether someone's in pain? So your brain, my brain, all of our brains weigh about three pounds. They're probably the most complicated physical object we know of in the universe. We've got 89 billion neurons, each of which on average makes 100 connections. Compared to 30 years ago, we know infinitely more about it than we did then. Compared to 30 years from now, they'll look back and say they knew nothing. And I think in outlines, I think we've got a few of the Roman numerals and a couple of the capital letters, and that's about it. What's happened is revolutions in tools. All scientific revolutions ultimately are revolutions in tools. And the big tool change in neuroscience has been magnetic resonance imaging, so MRI machines, and a particular use of them called functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI. The basic story here is we put Joe in the scanner, and we show him a picture. And two to six seconds later, we figure out what parts of his brain are getting fresh blood. It's not a lot of fresh blood, but your brain is an energy hog. It's currently using about 20% of all the energy in your body, even though it's only three pounds. And so when you work under what somebody brilliantly labeled the BOLD hypothesis, the blood oxygen level determination hypothesis. When a part of the brain works, it gets flooded with fresh blood. And we use those to say, aha, this part of Joe's brain lights up when he hears uh, the ice cream truck pass by. And this part of his brain lights up when his kids start yelling at him. And that's basically correlating activation patterns, correlating where your brain is working with your sensations is the way we're learning more about how the brain generates the mind. So walk us through how you would figure out whether somebody is telling the truth from looking at which parts of their brain light up. I mean, it almost sounds like a kind of modern day version of phrenology, you know, where you look at the skull and you figure out this is the truth telling place. Right, And, and people thought about it that way at first, But nobody's found the site of deception in the brain. I mean, we know the site of your ability to be able to make words. That's located in Broca's region, which is about here. And your ability to find words, which is in a place called Wernicke's region, about there. But most things actually involve large and different chunks of your brain. And nobody, to be honest, has a good clue about what, why they're detecting the deception signal they are. But there have been over 40 peer-reviewed published scientific articles that have said when we round up the usual subjects, the undergrad psych majors, and we put them in the scanner and we tell them to lie about something, 
we see a pattern that with about 80% accuracy lets us determine when they're lying and when they're telling the truth. It's not one region. It's a pattern of activations of regions. It's not 100%. It's 80%. And it's not real people. It's undergrad psych majors <laughs> in an experiment. But, Hank, I was once told that one of the things we look for is just more activation in general because it's harder to lie than to tell the truth for most of us. Yeah, that's that's one of the just so stories out there. It's uh -huh, one of the theories, true. but one of the problems with these forty peer reviewed papers is some of them many of them highlight different locations. So there's not a consistent story that's come together. Whereas with something like um, whether you're there's a region in your brain called the fusiform face area, if you see a face or you look at a full moon and you see a face in it, that lights up and we've got a theory about that. We got a bunch of, of hand waving ideas about deception, but nobody really has a good explanation for why they're getting the activations they are. But but, but we heard you say eighty percent accuracy, and if I only seize upon that, yeah. maybe I say I don't care what your theory is. If you can be eighty percent accurate, that's better than fifty percent for some uses, maybe I'll take that. Yeah, uh, and in fact, it's one of the one of the conflicts between the scientists and the lawyers. The scientists say, we want to know why. It's really, if we don't know why, we don't know anything. And the lawyers say, if there's a good correlation, if it's a strong enough correlation, I don't care why. If you can tell me if X, then 80% of the time Y, the letter Y, not the question Y, then I'm happy with it. So it might be good enough, if, in fact, we believe it. And, and do you? No, not really. <laughs> um, not enough. So here's my biggest problem with it. Apart from the fact that undergrad psych majors are not representative of the world, they're what we called weird. They're white, uh, educated, industrialized, rich, uh, developed country subjects. Dilettantes. <laughs> that too. Um, but the bigger problem is they are in an experiment where they've signed a consent form, they know it's an experiment, somebody has told them, when you see this, lie. Is that really like what happens when my mother every Thanksgiving says, the turkey was too dry, wasn't it? <laughs> and I say, no, it was perfect, as always. I hope my mother's not listening. You're, actually, your turkeys always are wonderful. Oh, um, I see something lighting up. <laughs> yes. I see something lighting up. <laughs> and, and we don't know what, how, how akin it is to somebody being asked, did you try to buy cocaine from this undercover officer? No, of course I didn't. So it's what we call an ecological reality, ecological realism problem. And that, I think, is the – that plus the fact that the different studies show different areas lighting up. And one other thing, it turns out you need a really cooperative subject for lie detection, for this kind of fMRI lie detection. If you start moving your tongue around inside your mouth, no one can see it, but you mess up the fMRI. I'm if, already trying it. If you think about wiggling your toes, if you count backwards from 100 by 7. You mean if you think about wiggling your seven, toes, not, wink, not actually wiggling them, but just thinking about wiggling yep, your toes. Yep. <laughs> there's, a, there's a great study by George Oganis at Harvard. He had... Ten subjects. Another problem with all this is the ends are very small. He had ten subjects. He was 100 percent accurate. Then he told him, do it again and think about wiggling your toes. And he went down to 30 percent accurate. So there's some problems. This is not ready for prime time. This is Stanford Legal. And today we're talking about evidence law and technology and neuroscience. And our first guest is Hank Grilly. Um, can, I, can I ask you about another aspect of this sort of experimentation that I've, re that I've read about, which is um, that uh, they say that by doing fMRIs, you can tell whether somebody has seen something before or whether this is the first time they're seeing it. Can you walk us through that? Because that's always struck me as really interesting for questions about eyewitness identification and yes. things like that. So the best work I know of about this is done by Anthony Wagner here at Stanford and um, a former postdoc of his who's now at UCLA. And they equipped Stanford undergrads, again, those usual subjects, with little cameras that took a bunch of pictures. And they showed them some of the pictures along with some pictures of things that they hadn't seen. And they asked them to, to tell them whether they thought they recognized it. And they were around 85 to 90 percent accurate just by looking at the fMRI pattern and determining whether somebody thought they recognized this or not. They tried to see whether people in fact had 
accurately recognized it, and they were better than chance, statistically significantly better than chance, but only 58% accurate. So we're pretty good at being able to tell whether you think you've seen it before, but that's not really helpful from a legal perspective. We're not very good. Yeah, we want to know whether you did see it, not whether you think you saw it. Now, there is another method out there that's intriguing that uses a different kind of lie detection called the guilty knowledge test. And this uses an EEG. EEG, electroencephalogram, old, cheap, portable, easy, whereas MRI, expensive, difficult, et cetera. You show somebody or have them listen to or somehow give them an experience, and if their brain thinks somehow – Either it recognizes it or it remembers it, or my guess is it's salient, it's important. 280 milliseconds later, a certain EEG wave happens called the P300 wave because they were too dumb to get it right at P280 wave. So there's a, a, a researcher at Northwestern named Peter Rosenfeld who did this great study. He had eight pictures of iconic photos from a city, Eiffel Tower, Golden Gate Bridge, and he had eight pictures of locations like – sports arena, train station, airport, and he had eight pictures of instruments of destruction, machine guns, bombs, nuclear stuff. Each person got to see one of each. He then showed them in random order, all 24 of them, and by looking at the P300 wave, he was 90% accurate at picking out exactly what those people had seen. That guilty knowledge test is a different – it's not memory exactly – that one, I think, has a lot of potential, but Peter, being a really good scientist and being uh, savvy as well, immediately put a postdoc to work looking to see if there were countermeasures to make it not work. And when that guy succeeded, he put another uh, postdoc to work, seeing whether there were countermeasures to the countermeasures, and there were. So it's interesting, promising. We'll see. So I want to turn to the other thing that Joe mentioned that you've been taking a look at, which is um, neuroscience and figuring out whether people are actually in pain. Could you tell us a little bit about what the developments are there? Sure. Ow! Yes, that hurt. And it hurt my hand. It hurt the hand I hit. It hurt the hand I hit with. But the pain is but in the brain. But it hurt me more than it hurt you. I doubt it, actually. <laughs> but the pain is in the brain. Um, there are actually people born with a genetic condition that means they can't feel any pain because their brains aren't structured to feel the pain. It's actually quite disabling. There's a whole James Bond movie about that, but go on. I'd watch it, but I can feel pain, so I think I won't. Okay. Um, so you, fMRI is being used to find the networks. And again, it's not just one location. It's four or five locations that get activated in a particular order when people report having the sensation of pain. This is potentially really useful because we don't have any good, really good tests for most pain. You get hit rear-ended by a car and you complain about neck or back pain. The x-ray probably won't show it. And if it shows something, it's something that, could, that perfectly healthy non-pain people can have. If this works, it could be a really useful check on people's self-report about whether they have pain or not. That's not so important in the criminal context, although you could probably construct some scenarios where it worked. But not just auto accidents and tort cases. There are hundreds of thousands of Social Security disability hearings and proceedings mm -hmm. every year where somebody claims, my pain is so bad that I'm disabled, I can't work, pay me. Some of those people get money when they shouldn't. Some of those people don't get money when they should. If this works, uh, it'll be a real advance, and it'll save a lot of lawyers and judges a lot of wasted time as well. This is Stanford Legal, and today we're talking about neuroscience and how it applies to questions that get raised all the time in the context of legal cases, truth-telling and pain. We're talking about it with Hank Greeley, our colleague at Stanford Law. And Hank, I want to follow up on how this could help triers of fact, as we say in law, Right now, you've got to make that determination. Is someone lying to you or not? And I know one thing that has recently come to light is there's some evidence that doctors, for example, might be more skeptical of poor people, of African Americans, of other marginalized groups that report pain. It, that could reflect racism, but it could also reflect some biases or just some unwanted Un unneeded generalizations, if we could really get to that. 
Right. So you'd have to have something other than MRI to use for this because you're not going to spend several thousand dollars in the examining room. But if you got a cheap, easy way of doing it, doctors are now increasingly in a dilemma. If they give opiates and other painkillers too frequently, the Drug Enforcement Administration comes down on them hard. If they give it too infrequently, their patients don't get relief. And they have no better way than trying to read people – of reading people's minds than the ones we all use all the time, which we know are not 100 percent accurate. So if they could tell, yes, this person, their brain is showing signs that they are in fact in pain. This one isn't. It could help them distinguish between people who are engaged in, in inappropriate drug-seeking behavior either to abuse it themselves or to sell it on the black market versus the people who really are in pain. And pain is so complicated that it's really hard to tell whether or not somebody truly is in pain, whether or not drugs truly are working on them. Somebody for whom codeine doesn't work and so they want something stronger. About 7% of Americans get no response from codeine for genetic reasons. So, yeah, taking care of you – know, Helping to mitigate race bias, there's some evidence on gender bias, there's some evidence on class bias, would be another really good use of this kind of technology if you could do it cheaply and easily and accurately enough to bring it to the doctor's office. Do we, do we worry about people coming up with their own countermeasures? So I want to get some more drugs and – is thinking about pain enough to to register those pain waves? So I've been trying to get actually a Stanford doc who works on this, Sean Mackey, to do this experiment. He's done a little bit of it, but he hasn't done enough to publish. I've had two kidney stones. I do not recommend them. They are intense pain. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the only time my doctor wife has ever seemed genuinely sympathetic to <laughs> my health conditions. Well, that and the vasectomy. But uh, – <laughs> It's really painful. If I lie the in the TMI scanner. The TMI part of my brain is lighting up. <laughs> if I lie in the scanner and I think about that kidney, those kidney stones and I actually can pull back kind of a too vivid recollection of those kidney stones, will it look like I'm in pain? Sean's preliminary work, as I understand it, says no, you can distinguish between it. There's another line of work that says you can distinguish between um, – the, between nerve impulses being re received by your brain from ex outside parts of the body, it's a really good question. Probably it can be fixed, but we won't know until the work gets done. I mean, I guess you got to wonder about the method actor and <laughs> how they would how they would experience. Or, you know. or of course, Bill Clinton feeling your pain. Yeah, although I I, I won't even say my favorite on onion headline of ever ever. Can't do that, Pam. Yeah, it was President feels nation's pain, comma breasts. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, one of the one of the questions you you've mentioned the cost issue. Is this one of these areas that's a little bit like so many other scientific areas where the cost is likely to go down over time, or is this like a lot of healthcare areas where the cost is just likely to go up and up and up? So yes and no. The cost of MRIs is not likely to go down very much. Um, and and why is that? They, they require these superconducting magnets. They generate a magnetic field that's about a million times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. And to do that, you need to cool these magnets down to liquid helium – with liquid helium to four degrees above absolute zero, which makes, you know – Alberta, Canada in February look warm by comparison. It's like minus 373 Fahrenheit. The, that costs a lot of money I and mean, takes a lot of equipment. Will we come up with some other way of doing this, so do you think? One, so we might get to MRI through higher temperature superconductors, which have been really exciting for 20 years and still aren't here. Or we might come up with other tools – the BRAIN initiative that the U.S. government under President Obama instituted is looking for other tools. They're not there yet. But I think there's a decent chance. Um, how soon? How good? How expensive? But newer tools could bring – newer. this is an area where I think newer tools could bring down the expense. And the real benefit, if you could get – if you could figure out how to do any of this with EEG, uh, that's, that takes out – a hundredfold the cost. Takes the cost down a hundredfold or more. We'll be back with more from our guest, uh, Hank Greeley, and we'll be introducing another one of our colleagues to you uh, after we take a little break next on Stanford Legal on Sirius XM Insight 121. <laughs> 